YouTube stream? Perfect. So we are live on YouTube now. So uh, either put your pants on or turn your cameras off. And uh, the, so it's my pleasure to have Ian talking this afternoon. Um, so Ian is one of the organizers uh, who uh, will be leading everything next week and you have plenty of chances to interact more with him. Um, just briefly, Ian uh, did his PhD actually in solid state physics, working with quantum Hall systems and uh, then saw the light, realized that uh, atomic systems were much superior and has since uh, then worked on uh, um, atomic systems, starting with his postdoc at uh, NIST, where he sort of converted into a physicist position there in University of Maryland, I guess. Um, and, and uh, since then, he's worked on ultra cold atoms and has really been a pioneer in uh, synthetic systems of all types. And he'll tell us about what that word means in this context. So go for it, Ian. Looking forward to your lecture. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction, Caden. And thanks, everyone, for uh, showing up to this talk. So firstly, yeah, Caden's right. I, I trans transitioned from condensed matter physics. And in fact, he said, I saw the light. And that's also literally the case. And that in my PhD, the only laser I used was a laser pointer. So I saw so many more photons when I switched over to, to doing cold atom physics. All right. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say to emphasize is that if you have any questions or anything like that, please just unmute yourself, holler it out, raise a hand, whatever you need to do. And I'll, I'll try to notice it and address it. So if we only get through half of this talk, that's great. Alrighty, so what I'll be talking about today is uh, I'm going to call synthetic electromagnetism with the cold atoms. And a lot of the work I'll be describing is, is not new work, and I'm under the assumption that a lot of you are not familiar, as I am, with my own work. So hopefully you'll get a good sense of how you can emulate both electrical and magnetic fields using cold atom systems. Um, and I'm going to give two examples in this talk that I will then describe shortly. So the first thing I'd like to do though, is give just a bit of perspective about how I place cold atoms in the kind of research that I would like to do. So I'm thinking of cold atoms as predominantly a mini body or condensed matter kind of system. And I'd like to organize my thoughts around them as being a kind of material. Um, they are chunks of stuff. Um, they're great materials because as an experimentalist, many of their properties can be controlled in the laboratory and controlled on dynamical time scales. So this is really by contrast with a, a, a material, let's say a quantum hall system, where if you're having tunneling going on and you want more tunneling, you go to your grower and he makes you a new crystal that does more tunneling. All right. Uh, by contrast with cold atoms, if you want more tunneling, you change the intensity of an optical lattice and you can do so instantaneously compared to all the dynamical time scales of the system, or you can do it slowly, thereby addressing both the adiabatic and instantaneous approximations from quantum mechanics. I think that's super cool. Um, another thing is that the Hamiltonians are very simple. And what that means is that as an experimentalist like myself, I can have really good collaborations with theorists because the starting point for a discussion uh, is going to be, here's my microscopic model. I've calibrated it carefully. What's gonna be the physics of this? And this is also by contrast with most many body physics where the microscopic Hamiltonian is so complicated that step one is making an effective description. And then usually you fight about the effective descriptions rather than having a common point to start a discussion. So that's amazingly good things about cold atoms. However, cold atoms are also bad as materials. Um, they don't live very long. The longest BEC might last 30 seconds before you have to go make another one. They're living in vacuum systems, so you can't poke and prod at them with wires. You have to use lasers and fields and maybe even electron microscopes uh, to probe them. So you don't really get to touch them in a tangible way like you do with materials. And lastly, um, all the interesting features at this point are added by hand. So if you want to do artificial gauge fields, you're gonna add some kind of laser or oscillatory magnet field to add the gauge field uh, construct. If you want lattices, you add optical lattice potentials. And what this means is that of necessity, a great number of cold atom experiments are very complicated because we want to add more and more and more, and that just makes it very complicated. All right. Muted myself. Um, so this is what the apparatus might look like. This is the one that the uh, half of the data I'll be presenting in today was taken on. Uh, in this experiment, a chunk of rubidium, as is pictured on the left, is heated up to about 400 Kelvin. And that produces an atomic beam that propagates on this graph from the left to the right, where it's captured in a magneto-optic trap, which you've definitely heard about at these lectures. And 
captured in a magnetic trap where it is finally evaporated in a crossed optical dipole trap to a degenerate cloud of atoms like is pictured on the right. Um, that particular cloud has a temperature in the neighborhood of 50 nanokelvin, and it repeats every 15 seconds. So we manufacture a cloud of atoms, we manipulate them, we measure it, and we repeat. And this is an extreme contrast with real materials or condensed matter systems where you stick it in the cryostat for months on end and do all your cool experiments. All right, so I want to reemphasize that. Um, every 15 seconds or so, we have a laser cooling stage, an evaporation stage, an experiment payload stage, and a measurement stage. And this measurement, you can think of it as being a destructive quantum measurement where we leach pretty much every piece of information available out of the system, whether we use it or not is up to us. Uh, and we further accelerate the atoms strongly with the laser pulse until they hit the wall of the vacuum system and are for all intents and purposes gone and we need to make another condensate. So we make it, we measure it, we destroy it and we repeat. All right. So with that backdrop, I'd like to think a little bit about how we can engineer atomic systems. And I, if you've ever been to an engineering talk, you've heard phrases like top up and bottom down. So I wanna think first about a sort of bottom up kind of approach. So um, I'm gonna phrase this for, as you'll see in a second for a reason as micromanaging quantum systems. And the idea is that you're gonna build quantum registers arrays up from well-controlled building block blocks and are almost always gonna be qubits. So the two examples that really epitomize this in my mind are arrays of superconducting uh, circuits or atomic ions, or I guess now the, uh, the neutral atom Rydberg tweezer arrays are very popular as well. So these are all quantum systems where you've decided, okay, I'm gonna have 17 qubits. I'm gonna control every single one of them. I'm gonna be able to measure all of them. So that's a bottom-up construction. What we do is a little bit different. It's not really top-down engineering, rather it's Hamiltonian engineering or in my metaphor, it's coaching quantum systems. So what we do is we build the Hamiltonian that describes the evolution of the system using well-controlled, well-calibrated control techniques. We introduce a bunch of agents, uh, neutral atoms into this Hamiltonian and we see what they do. Maybe we change the Hamiltonian in time, but there is no cases in these experiments where we're identifying a particular atom and saying, Adam, do this. We've set it down the rules and we're gonna see what happens when they follow the rules. So uh, three examples that I'll expand upon momentarily are putting atoms in optical lattice potentials, uh, tuning across Feshbach resonances to change the interaction strength and adding gauge fields, which will be the topic of this talk. Let me focus on those three cases. Uh, so one way you might uh, engineer a Hamiltonian for a cold atom system is to add potentials, right? So if I think about the Hamiltonian, I might have a kinetic energy term and I might have a potential term. Now, the atoms are confined in traps. There already is a confining potential. And now we're gonna put in a standing wave making an optical lattice as is pictured on the right. And by tuning the depth of the lattice, the experiment that I'm picturing was able to illustrate a transition from a superfluid phase in the limit of a shallow lattice to a quantum insulator, a mod insulator in the deep lattice limit. Okay, so that's one, one way we can tune uh, properties of our Hamiltonian. A second way is by interaction tuning. And for the purpose of this talk, I'd like to think about interaction terming, tuning as using a Feshbach resonance. Um, generally speaking, these Feshbach resonances tune the strength of the interactions between particles, but leave the interactions to be highly local, almost described by a delta function. So what the data on the, on the right is picturing is a transition between a paired uh, gas of, of fermions, essentially composite bosons, on, on the left side, a molecular BEC, and a very cold degenerate Fermi gas on the right-hand side. Okay, so that can be one thing that might happen as you tune the interactions. The third category of things, and that's what I'll focus on on this talk, are, are gauge fields. And in terms of the Hamiltonian, I wanna think about this as introducing terms in the kinetic energy part of the single particle Hamiltonian. So previously on the talk, we added potentials here, and now we're putting things inside the kinetic energy. Um, if this quantity A was a scalar and it depended upon position, that would be the vector potential used to represent a magnetic or electric field. Um, if this object is a, a matrix, it sometimes can be represent a describing spin or a coupling, that is the linking of motion to the internal spin degrees of freedom. Or more generally, if this object is just a generic matrix, you might be describing a non-abelian gauge field. 
That is to say, a gauge field whose individual components are described by non-commuting operators. And in cold atoms, all of these things have now been done to some extent or the other. Oh, I wanted to comment on this slide. The two in pink backgrounds are gonna be covered a little bit in this talk. All right, so I pulled this slide um, and modified it from a pretty old talk. A question you might want to ask is, why are we interested in lattices and gauge fields? What is it we'd like to accomplish uh, by doing this research? So here are some examples of physics that I personally think are interesting, and you can have things that you personally think are interesting. That's, you can think these are boring, that's fine with me. Um, but I'd like to think about, if you'd like to do quantum Hall physics with, with ultra cold atoms, what, what do you need? If you'd like to do quantum magnetism, what do you need? If you want to do topological superconductivity, what do you need? Or topological insulators or certain kinds of chaos. And what you see on this list are the things in red are properties that ultra cold neutral atoms typically don't have. Um, they can be bosons or fermions, fine, we got that. But there, if you apply a magnetic field, you get a Zeeman shift. So in this talk, I'll be talking about making artificial magnetic fields. If you wanted to do quantum magnetism, you need spin-spin interactions over a non-zero range, but that needs to be engineered. If you want to do P-wave superconductors, you need some way to engineer something that's like a P-wave interaction. That almost never happens except with lots of loss. If you want to do topological insulators, typically you're gonna be looking for something uh, with, with some degree of spin orbit coupling along with an interesting band structure. So the stuff in red are all this complexity I mentioned earlier, that you have to add to begin realizing the physics that you might want to map onto these cold atom systems, like fractional quantum Hall physics, P-wave superconductivity or topological insulators. I put chaos there um, because there's an experiment we just performed uh, using tools that I'll get to at the end that had sort of pre-chaotic behavior uh, in a really quite fun way. All right, so here is a sort of uh, outline for this talk. In the first part of the talk, I'm gonna be talking about creating artificial fields in free space. And then if I get to it, the second part of the talk, I'll be talking about creating fields in a lattice using the idea of synthetic dimensions. And I checked the schedule of lectures and hopefully Tillman Esslinger got to synthetic dimensions in his talk. Uh, if not, I'll- I don't think much. Okay. So if he didn't, I will briefly introduce the idea and I'll introduce it less briefly maybe than I was anticipating uh, uh, in that circumstance. Okay. All right, so we're gonna switch over now um, from my introduction to now building up uh, some physics. And this is a cool picture my graduated student, uh, Karina took many years ago of the lab through a two inch polarizing beam splitting cube. So you can see different directions with different polarizations. And uh, it's always quite nice. All right. So, so I'm part, I apologize if my cursor moves around. There's this bar that Zoom puts up that I need to move from time to time. Okay, so we're thinking about synthetic electromagnetism with neutral atoms. And I will almost exclusively be talking about the behavior of quantum matter in the presence of static magnetic fields. They're gonna be static in two senses of the word static. One, I am not gonna deliberately change them in the course of any given experiment. There will simply be a magnetic field applied. Secondly, it's static in the sense that it's not a dynamical quantum degree of freedom. So in the real world, the magnetic field has a Hamiltonian associated with it, and it has excitations called photons. We're not gonna deal with any of that. We are gonna impose magnetic fields onto the system and see what the par particles do subject to that imposed field. So with that said, Let's think about what magnetic fields do do. So if we take some cold atoms and apply a magnetic field, the only thing they're really gonna do is exhibit the Zeeman effect. So what I'm plotting here are the energies as a function of magnetic field of the eight hyperfine states constituting the electronic ground state of rubidium 87, the atom I'll be talking about. And what you see is that as a function of increasing field, there's a field dependence to these energies, which a small field is nominally linear. That's it, that's the Zeeman effect. But what we want, um, as you think about it, either in terms of freshman or junior mechanics, is a force that results from taking uh, the cross product of the velocity times the magnetic field, i.e. something that gives cyclotron orbits. 
Uh, the language I'll be adopting in this talk, however, is a more appropriate for quantum mechanics uh, using the sort of junior mechanics version. So we'll describe the magnetic fields in terms of the curl of a vector potential A. The most common way to represent a uniform magnetic field, let's say along the Z direction, is in the gauge I've written here, which is a symmetric gauge. In fact, we'll be using the Landau gauge, which sticks all of the dependence on one quantity. We'll get to that. And then you describe the Hamiltonian as I illustrated in the previous slide here. In terms of classical mechanics, you would then have Hamilton's equations of motion down here. And of course, we'll deal slightly differently in quantum mechanics. So the aim is to have what's on the right-hand slide, half of the slide, not what's on the left-hand half of the slide. All right. So our task is to become Hamiltonian engineers. We're gonna go forth into the world and attempt to engineer this single particle Hamiltonian where we put a vector potential, potential component in X, we put a vector potential component in Y, and we imbue these a dependence upon space in such a way that the curl is non-zero. So the example I gave before was, was a symmetric gauge. And in this talk, we'll be engineering the Landau gauge in which the vector potential only has one component, here the Y component, which depends exclusively upon the opposite spatial variable X so that the curl is non-zero. The fields we create are gonna look like authentic fields. Uh, what that means is we're gonna engineer a vector potential and I'm gonna point out that it's time derivative in fact will give rise to an effective electric field. And we're gonna engineer a spatial dependence to this vector potential and show that its curl gives rise to a magnetic field. All right, so enter the word synthetic. Our particles are charge neutral. How are we gonna progress? Well, before we entered into this game, by we, I mean my group, a kind of effective magnetic field, in fact, had been engineered. And it's engineered by taking the system and putting it into a rotating frame of reference. So if you take a cloud of atoms and then experiments both from JILA and MIT, cause them to spin rapidly in an extremely isotropic uh, confining potential, one can make a transformation into the rotating frame. And what you discover is that in the rotating frame, the Coriolis force introduces two terms into the kinetic energy of the Hamiltonian that exactly represent a magnetic field expressed in the symmetric gauge. And in addition, there's a, a modification of potential from the centripetal term to this uh, effective uh, Hamiltonian. So I wanna just say that these work really great. This is a beautiful vortex lattice. And in fact, vortex lattices of this quality have not been realized using artificial gauge fields. So artificial gauge fields uh, allow us to put on optical lattice potentials and do different kinds of experiments. So this is truly beautiful data. And you can see that it's not, not particularly new data. Okay, so uh, we're, we're talking uh, 15 years ago or so kind of data. Now there are other proposals for creating effective magnetic fields. There's a category of stroboscopic proposals. Um, the citation I give down here uh, is not a category that has been realized. But I would relabel this now Floquet proposals. And many groups have used Floquet like proposals for creating effective magnetic fields. Um, you can also call them photon assisted tunneling, where the optical phase imprinted by induced tunneling creates the phases in a lattice appropriate for magnetic field. And the second half of my talk will perhaps explain that more. A third category of, of yeah. There's a question from Francisco How is the cloud rotated if it's in an isotropic trap? Uh, that's a great question. So the trap wasn't always isotropic. Uh, the, the JILA data and the MIT data accomplish this in technically different ways. The MIT data had a isotropic confining potential and they inserted one or two uh, blue detunes, so I think they're actually green, uh, stirring beams that they then rotated about one another to whisk it up, kind of like you'd beat up some eggs. And then that adds a bunch of angular momentum and of course a whole bunch of other excitations. And then you just wait a while, the thing cools down and you end up with vortex lattices like this. And if you look, this lattice has, uh, it's not a perfect lattice. There's like a dislocation here. If you try to trace this line of vortices across, it jumps. So there, this is not a perfect lattice. The Jilla technique, I use a little bit more finesse. So what they did in these experiments for the sort of penultimate and ultimate experiments is they started with a not quite degenerate cloud of bosons. And then in a top trap, that's a time-orbiting potential trap, they had shim coils that made it slightly imperfect in its uh, 
aspect ratio, and they, and they phase those in time so the trap began spinning up. So then you follow the rotating frame of the trap, and in that rotating frame, it's static. So they spun up the trap while the atoms were thermal, and then made it isotropic and evaporated the atoms and the resulting isotropic potential so that they formed a BEC while the magnetic field or the rotation was present. Um, just to finish the story, to make a heroic task even more heroic, um, in subsequent experiments, they couldn't make them rotate fast enough. So they invented a new form of evaporation in which a push laser um, ejected atoms from the center of the trap, essentially removing those atoms with the least angular momentum. It's a kind of evaporation that caused the thing to further speed up. And this was an extremely delicate, finessed way in which they could make basically perfect vortex lattices. And there's a series of paper from Merritt Cornell's group where they look at properties of these vortex lattices. There's a super vortex paper, which is pretty cool. So that's, I hope that answers the question that, yeah, if it was always symmetric, then there would be nothing to break the symmetry and you get with angular momentum you started with. Right. So I think I was about to say, uh, Item three, there's some proposals for creating gauge fields using immersion. And the idea there was you take one atomic species, let's say potassium 39, you'd spin it up to high speed and you'd embed in it a gas of some other atom, a cerebidium 87. And the collisions between these atoms would give something like a gauge field for the otherwise unrotating one. Uh, what, we, what I'm gonna do in the first half of this talk is talk about a fourth category of approaches, which I'm gonna label as Raman techniques. And, oh, I see two things in the chat. Oh, that's the one you got, okay, excellent. Um, so in these Raman techniques, we illuminate a pair of, a, a cloud of atoms with a pair of counter-propagating, uh, I'm gonna call them Raman lasers, they drive Raman transitions. And as a result of this, with some finessing of other potentials, uh, an effective magnetic field appears in the Hamiltonian describing the system, giving a vortex arrays as I'm picturing on the left. Okay, so here is a more nuanced outline of this part of the talk. So I'm first gonna tell you, yes. Why do we need new methods? Those old vortex lattices look pretty good. Yeah, so the, the motivation behind this work had two parts and one of them has come to fruition and one of them has not yet come to fruition. So the first part that, that has come to, 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 re, to be is that we wanted two things. Uh, we wanted this kind of magnetic fields in the presence of optical lattices. So if you want to have re strongly interacting systems that are also subject to gauge fields, you either need to also add a Feshbach resonance, which has not been done uh, to these rotating systems, or you need to have some, a system that is compatible with the effective interactions induced by putting things into a lattice. And the technique I described here first works with lattices, and then the subsequent techniques using photon assisted tunneling even, are even more appropriate for lattices. So that would be reason number one, so that you can have them uh, in lattices. And then the second uh, part of that reason is that you don't really want to be confined to isotropic potentials. There are, so, there are other configurations you might want to have vortices in. You might want to do vortices in a box potential. You might want to look tra at transport like Tilman Esslinger's group does. You'd like to do this with gauge fields present. And rotation really, although beautiful for symmetry, inhibits these kind of extensions. Uh, the second thing we wanted to do, the part that has not come to fruition, uh, is to really approach the fractional quantum Hall limit. So not just study strong interactions, but be in the strong interacting high field limit. Uh, for the technique uh, I'm describing here, Raman dressing, we did a whole bunch of preliminary calculations so you can make clusters of atoms, hundreds of atoms, and maybe get to the fractional quantum Hall regime. And I will tell you about the Achilles heel now rather than later, which is that when you shine these kind of Raman themes on for the first part of this talk, uh, the spontaneous emission, this unwanted spontaneous scattering of photons in random directions is a reasonably high rate for the system, causing heating on a time scale that inhibits going to strongly correlated systems of that nature. When I go to the second part of the talk and talk about photon assisted tunneling and synthetic dimensions, it turns out the spontaneous emission issue is for all intents and purposes completely lifted. Um, but there are other subtleties with that system that come in to make the physics different, although equally rich. All right, so back to the outline. So I'll tell you how we create a synthetic vector potential, we engineer a vector potential, and then I'll give examples of making that vector potential depend upon either time or space. And on this talk, not both at once. All right. 
So now I want to take a back step back. We're doing we're quantum engineers. And as engineers, the first thing we need to do is pick our ingredients, our building blocks. And these building blocks in this talk will be rubidium 87. For what I'm describing right now for synthetic magnetic fields using the gradient, using the Raman approach and continuum, rubidium works pretty well. I understand some groups are trying to do this now in dysprosium and erbium, and I would expect it to work quite well in those systems. Uh, doesn't work as well in the lighter alkalis uh, for purely atomic physics reasons having to do with the hyperfine splitting. It doesn't work super well in cesium for collisional reasons having to do with the fact there's only one state you can operate in and make degenerate gases effectively. And variants of these techniques likely would work with the alkaline earths as well. Okay, so now we've picked our atom for vitium 87. And now we need to look at the atom. We have our ingredient and the handles we have on our ingredient to control our ingredient are plotted over here. So we have atoms in the amplitude in the ground state. We have excited states and everything in this talk, we're gonna be using uh, the transitions between the five S to the five P state as our handles with which we will be controlling these atoms. Most of the time, or more accurately, most of the amplitude of the atoms is gonna be contained in the electronic ground state, which I mentioned before has an F equals one and an F equals two hyperfine manifold. Furthermore, we're gonna focus on F equals one and the extremely small magnetic field limit in which the displacement of those states as a function of energy is practically linear. Okay, so that's gonna be where we work. And what I'd like to do is give you an intuitive feel for how this works with a minimum input of com complexity and a minimum input of calculations. So for this part of the talk, I want you to think about two levels, psi one and psi two, and they're gonna be coupled together by some Hamiltonian, or initially we'll have some Hamiltonian with energy one and energy two, uh, that might be a function of some parameter as I'm plotting here. I'm gonna leave unspecified what this parameter is. We then apply a, a coupling matrix element I'm not going to specify how it's applied. And in the two level system, a gap will always open in the spectrum where this crossing originally took place. So the engineering of vector potentials that I will now describe can be intuitively understood in terms of these avoided crossings. So here's how it works. Uh, we're going to start with a cloud of rubidium 87 atoms in the F equals one state pictured here. We're then going to illuminate them with a pair of counter propagating lasers that I'll call Raman lasers. And the frequency difference between these beams is selected so that it basically resonantly couples uh, states, let's say MF equals minus one to zero and zero to plus one. And since we're in the linear Zeeman regime, two pairs of lasers will drive both of these transitions equally well. Okay, so that, that coupling is happening. A second important feature is that these beams are counter propagating. And what that means is that if you're sitting, for example, an MF equals zero initially and have a free particle dispersion relation like this, if you were to acquire a photon from beam one and be stimulated to emit into beam two, that atom to conserve momentum would have to have two photon recoils of momentum. I'd like to comment that the energy unit I'll use for the entirety of this talk is a single photon recoil energy, which is the energy such an atom would have. In this case, it's three kilohertz or 140 nanokelvin. So our ultra cold temperatures are pretty important to resolve these energy scales. So back to this graph, if I'd like to plot the, the family of states, which are coupled by vertical transitions to these states initially in MF equals zero, I would plot, for example, a dot there, atom in MF equals zero coupled to that state in MF equals plus one. Why is it shifted up in energy? Because it will have four photon recoils of energy, two recoils of momentum, h bar squared, k squared over two n. What if I go and have one recoil of momentum here? Well, now my initial state is resonant, including the kinetic energy with my final state, and so forth. Now, what you draw is a parabola for the atoms in MF equals plus one, which is displaced horizontally by two units of momentum. And this then shows the family of states that are coupled together vertically by the Raman coupling. And this is the zero detuning case where the minima of these objects align with one another. Uh, similarly, for atoms in MF equals minus one, the transitions go the opposite direction and the parabola is displaced in the opposite direction. And now you see that on this graph, there are three crossings that can potentially turn into avoided crossings. Uh, another feature I'd like to point out is that we can control the energy offset between these by changing slightly the magnetic field, thereby changing the resonance condition, uh, thereby, for example, shifting this up in energy and that down in energy. 
The orange dot here plots a situation where we've deliberately tuned the detuning by four recalls, bringing into resonance atoms in MF equals minus one to those in MF equals zero. Uh, if we turn on the coupling fields instantaneously using the instantaneous approximation from quantum mechanics, we can look at the resulting unitary evolution, which is plotted here. And graphs like this and fits to them are how we determine the coefficients that go into our model. So I mentioned earlier, I can collaborate with theorists. Well, I don't exactly know how bright my Raman lasers are in the center of my vacuum system. There have been windows in the way, but I can perform experiments like this, which at the sort of a couple of percent level of uncertainty, give me the model parameters that now describe the evolution of my system. And here then are the avoided crossings that are associated with diagonalizing the Hamiltonian, giving rise to this unitary evolution having started in this band down here. Okay. So what I want you to notice about this curve as I have a series of energies that are smoothly changing as a function of wave number or, or momentum. And that's highly reminiscent of a dispersion relation that has now been changed. So let's look at that more carefully. Supposing I go to a stronger degree of Raman coupling and I contrast the two cases of having zero detuning and having some non-zero detuning. What we see is that in the limit of strong laser coupling, these three minima lose their individual identity and merge to form a single smooth dispersion relation, which by symmetry has a minimum location centered at zero. By contrast, at a non-zero value of detuning, we have again a smooth dispersion relation, but its minimum is now at a non-zero value. The symmetry has been broken. So if you interpret this cavalierly as a dispersion relation, you'll see that we've engineered a vector potential. All the vector potential does, if you look at it, is it shifts the parabolas of the dispersion relation to a non-zero value. Um, since I wasn't going to talk about this much in this talk, I want to call your attention to some words I just said. Um, this needs to be in a sufficiently large limit of intensity such that these minima have merged together to form a single smooth dispersion relation. It is that large intensity requirement that gives a reasonably large spontaneous emission limited lifetime of this category of approaches. A different mathematical formulation in terms of adiabatic gauge potentials uh, requires you be in an adiabatic limit, which similarly is operative in the large intensity limit. So in the end of the day here, we have a vector potential, which I'm plotting here that we have engineered, or we've engineered a change in a vector potential more accurately as a function of detuning. So this is now our, yeah. Um, so it's clear that you're getting a shift in the in the location of this parabola that looks like a gauge field, but they're also changing their vertical position of the minimum. So do you get a scalar potential on top of this or what's going on? Absolutely, yes. So in, in this um, diagonalization kind of description, you indeed see that this is shifted downwards in energy, more or less because this state shifted down in energy. So if you were to plot the minimum of this uh, dispersion relation as a function of the tuning, you would see a feature that is highly reminiscent of a conventional avoided crossing. So that there's an anti-trapping uh, built into this uh, in much the same way that in rotating systems, you have an anti-trap from the Coriolis, from the uh, centripetal term. And, and mathematically actually, um, the transformation into the rotating frame and the gauge in the local gauge transformations to the adiabatic approach are related to one another and these kind of shifts are unavoidable in that kind of treatment. But then this anti-trapping must be weak compared to the real trap or something or? That's right. So the, the, the benefit, the, the, if I'm to comment a little bit on the rotation experiments, one of the things that makes those hard is that you are trying to keep the atoms trapped. So you're balancing your harmonic confinement against the anti-trap. Um, and what you're doing is then in the end, subtracting two big numbers squared so that you have one number that you want squared. And no trap is perfect. I said perfectly isotropic, of course that's not true. So as you rotate faster and faster, you get more and more sensitive to imperfections in the confining potential. And that's one of the things that made those experiments difficult. And this one, we're not aiming to have any particular potential. So what we did in these experiments is as we turned up the parameters that we're putting gradients into this, we compensated by increasing the dipole trap intensity a little bit to keep the, the confinement reasonable. But yeah, that's a, a good thing to notice. Alrighty. All right, so now I'd like to transition uh, to showing data. In order to do that, I'd like to describe a little bit our measurement process. Can I ask one thing? 
Yeah. Uh, so previously, when you showed these shifted parabolas, I guess you're getting some vector potential AX, but it's still not position dependent, right? So that you can get a curve. That's right. Here. So I haven't established for you yet how I make it position dependent. <laughs> okay. Um, but I do want, definitely want to transition to data. So the data we're going to be taking in this talk is time of flight data. So what we'll do is, uh, this is my classical picture. We'll start with a cloud of atoms confined in some trap. And classically, they have some velocity before time of flight. We then turn off the trap and wait a while and take a picture. And obviously, the atoms that were moving more rapidly, such as this one and this one, end up having displaced and gone a larger distance. We're going to combine this time of flight imaging with the stern gerlach effect, where we're going to apply a magnetic field gradient such that the magnetic moment distinguishing these three atoms will also displace them. This allows me to draw pictures like this. So this is some superposition state of spin for a Bose condensate. And what you see is that you see a cloud of atoms here. Um, that would be the BEC. And because it had admixtures and MF equals minus one and plus one along the vertical direction, we can map out the spin degree of freedom. And so that's gonna, our pictures are always gonna look like this for the remainder of the talk. All right, so more or less, here's how it looks like in the laboratory. We start with atoms as a BEC, so at zero momentum, in the MF equals minus one hyperfine state. So my graph here, they're going to be in the minus one state, which is a weak field seeking state. So it has increasing energy with magnetic field. And it's in the neighborhood of four gauss of magnetic field. Uh, we then go through a complicated song and dance, which I don't want to go into, to adiabatically transform that state into being at the minimum of this dispersion relation. So this state is a superposition of three hyperfine states, MF equals minus one, plus one, and zero. And let me scroll back here. Those states have different momenta. This one has zero momenta. This one in red has a positive two recoils. This one in blue has negative recoils. So we have a spin momentum superposition. And here is that being revealed in these sturm gerlach experiments. Atoms in MF equals zero are at rest. If we go to MF equals plus one, there's minus two recoils of momentum and minus one has plus two recoils of momentum. So already I want to highlight that there's something a little strange going on. These guys are quantum mechanically coupled. And if you just sit there and do nothing, the atoms in fact do nothing, even though they have superpositions of three different momentum states. So the Raman lasers in some sense keep those states locked together and prevents this cloud from flying apart as something with these components otherwise would do. All right, now as we change the detuning, shifting in this case to the right, we see two things happen. First, each of these states has moved to the, to the right by an amount given by the aggregate shift of momentum here. And the amplitude has changed. This, the decomposition of this has changed. Uh, as you might expect, one of the parabolas has become lower here and you see a larger admixture into that state. Very good. So we can now demonstrate that if we adiabatically load that state, we see the outcomes we might want to see. And now I'd like to address the question which was just asked, how do we imbue this with a spatial dependence? Well, this is a cross section a schematic of the apparatus these experiments were performed in. And these hashes here, here, and here, grids, are cross sections through a quadrupole magnetic field, or sorry, quadrupole coil that will give gradient magnetic fields. So the idea then is we have a static bias field present anyways, let's say along this direction. We then energize this coil a little bit. As a result of this, the detuning depends upon space as of, uh, going through the atomic cloud. So in other words, I have a transfer function that takes my vector potential and makes it explicitly a function of the tuning, which itself can be a function of x, y, and t. In addition, and the fact we don't utilize, this uh, vector potential is also a function of the coupling strength omega. So now you can sort of see what the idea is. I have a detuning graph like this. We put on a magnetic field gradient and the center of the system is in resonance. But as you displace away from the center, the detuning also changes, giving a spatially inhomogeneous vector potential. So keep that in mind. Another thing we can do is we can change the detuning delta in time. We can simply abruptly change the magnetic field, causing the detuning everywhere to change. And what will happen then? Well, 
we'll have a quantity A experiencing a DADT. And a DADT is the vector potential contribution to an electric field. So before we see magnetic fields, let's see if these electric fields work out. Uh, I skipped some slides here. And the answer is, heck yes, it works great. So the bottom axis here is plotting the observed change in vector potential, or sorry, com commanded change in vector potential, knowing our calibration of the vector potential curve. And the vertical axis is plotting the observed change in momentum, literally asking the question, how fast are the atoms going as a result from changing it? And what we see is a nearly perfect linear relationship between these. And in the tiny box, uh, these X's were measured in a different way where we looked at the resulting sinusoidal evolution in a harmonic trap. So the point is that this vector potential, although it's a trick, it behaves just like the real thing. It gives rise to both electric fields and as you will see shortly, magnetic fields. All right, so I described a little bit the loading procedure we have. And now what we're gonna do is apply a magnetic field gradient along the Y direction for a system along which the Raman kick is along the X direction. And this combination of things will give a vector potential living in the X part of the Hamiltonian that is a function of Y. And when we do that uh, using data analyzed in exactly the same way I described before, you see pictures that transition in the top picture showing the diffraction orders like I illustrated before to one in which vortices is spontaneously entered into the system um, as is in the bottom, evidencing the presence of this effective or artificial magnetic field. And to sort of uh, drive this point home, here are a series of images showing the progression from having no gradient to a reasonably large gradient. And what you see is as a function of increasing gradient, the number of vortices proliferates, but only above a critical value. And this critical value is in fact something also predicted by theory. And these experiments were the most accurate measurement of this critical value to date. So here, the idea is that in a rotating Bose gas, it costs more energy than you might expect because of the interactions of the system to put the first vortex in. But in the asymptotic limit, the density of vortices is proportional to the flux. So the gray bar here is a computed value. And for two different values of the Raman coupling, we see the proliferation of vortices only above that value. So looking at this data, do you guys have any other questions? Um, with regards to that D over DT, um, you showed this linear plot. Uh, was that supposed to mean that like electric field is D over DT, so you get a corresponding DP over DT? Is that what you're plotting here? This plot? Yeah. Uh, what this plot is, measure is plotting is the observed change in momentum of the cloud, so the actual mechanical momentum associated with having changed the vector potential. So what we did is that we, uh, so the, uh, this was the postdoc work of Yu Zhu Lin. What she did is first measure this dispersion relation very carefully as is plotted here. And then we fit it to the calculation of what a model predicted. So we have parameters, we calibrated it. And then we know for any particular detuning, if we change the tuning, for example, from minus 10 to zero, we look on this plot and say, okay, well, if we go from minus 10 to zero, the vector potential has changed by about minus 1.9 uh, uh, of these units of these recoil units. So then we do the experiment. This is the vector potential change that we've commanded by changing the detuning. And what you see in the vertical axis is the change in momentum of the system experience. So if you suddenly change an electric field, or sorry, if you, if you integrate this expression across some small time delta t when the vector potential is changing, you'll see you apply an impulse. You change the momentum by an amount simply related to the change in the vector potential. So that's what that's doing. And is not the, the curl of A, the magnetic field, is there not a contribution on the Lorentz force that you should get? Uh, oh, well, I'm so happy you asked that because that was the question I was trying to lead you guys to ask. So in these images, so, so to answer your question, no, there was nothing like that in that case because the, there was no gradients present. So the vector potential was, uni was spatially uniform. Um, in these experiments, in addition to vortices entering into the system, the cloud looks like it's beginning to twist sideways or, or be tilted and elongated. And that is resulting from exactly the effect you're asking about. So what's happening here is that we're applying a magnetic field gradient 
which is creating an inhomogeneous vector potential from the top to the bottom of the system. Sometimes vortices enter, sometimes they don't enter, but either way, it starts to skew sideways. And what's happening is that the moment we decide to initiate time of flight, the vector potential returns to zero. Therefore, there is a dA dt, which is in proportion to the height above the top of the system. So you get a bigger kick near the top, nothing near the center, and the opposite kick near the bottom. And the larger the gradient is, the larger the span of vector potentials were, and therefore the larger the, larger the shear, shearing motion was. So in this case, there was the consecutive application of a magnetic field gradient followed by a sudden change in vector potential. All right, so I'm going to transition at this point. It's about halfway through my lot of time. a question about the, this data? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, maybe I'm not looking at this correctly, but it seems like these vortices do not form the triangular lattice that we had in the rotating um, data. Is that correct, or am I just not seeing it properly? No, you, you're exactly right. So if you look, if you take a lot of data and look at a sort of a paracorrelation function, you'll see that they have local triangular order of about the right size. So you can see triangles here. But if you, if you try to make, claim it as a lattice, it's clearly not. There's maybe I have zig, zig, zig here, but where's the one that goes up there? Right. Okay, so your eyes are exactly correct. So what's going on here is that in this system, we started at time equals zero with a cloud that looked kind of like that and suddenly applied the magnetic field gradient. What has to happen in this case is that the vortices have to find their way into the system. And the vortices in terms of the condensate phase is a singularity in the phase. So it cannot spontaneously appear in the center of the system. It has to migrate from the outside of the system to the inside of the system. And this migration is a time consuming process. So they actually spiral around the outside until they make their way in. And once they get their way inside, then they need to discover the correct ground state configuration. So fundamentally the limitation here comes back again to that spontaneous emission limited lifetime. And this set of data, we couldn't hold them for longer than about, uh, the one over your lifetime was 1.4 seconds. So that turns out not to be enough time for this vortex lattice degree of freedom to relax into its ground state configuration. It's the good old thermalization problem, I'm guessing. Exactly. And it's just the configurational energy of a vortex lattice is super low. So it takes a long time to, to relax. Perfect, thank you. All right, so Can it's ask another question. question about perfect. Yeah. Because I'm actually going to, since I'm transitioning, anyone who wants to ask questions about the first half, now is the right time to do it. Oh, uh, I had a question about the, the shape of the cloud again. So you mentioned that um, it tilts over because uh, the A uh, field is changing as you ramp it back down. Um, yeah. Is there some way to sort of deconvolve this? Like if you know it's happening in a deterministic way, can you reconstruct what the vortices would have looked like before you uh, do time of flight? Uh, I guess the, the there's probably not a closed form solution to that one because the the behavior during time of flight also includes interactions, which sort of by some interaction pressure cause it to expand. So I think, however, if you make the assumption that all of those vortices have the same sign, which is a good assumption, then you could take that density put it into a GPE and run time backwards. So I, I think that numerically you could, you could solve that problem. Uh, if it was possible, to, if we were doing an, a system with a Feshbach resonance so that you could turn off interactions at the same moment time of flight began, then yeah, then it would be single particle physics and be fully invertible. So in Thanks. other than... Good. So in other than the sort of uh, synthetic magnetic field, you're actually modifying the dispersion in some complicated way, right? It's not just a simple magnetic field. Um, so is it just in the small omega sort of low temperature limit that it looks exactly like a magnetic field or with the usual dispersion or? Yeah, that's right. That's, that's a great way to think about it. So the, there, there's another thing I didn't bring up here, which I will, happily bring up now, if I can move around my own plots. Uh, this is a good one to illustrate. The curvature down here is different than the curvature up there anyway. So there's an a change in the effective mass, which in the limit of infinite laser coupling goes away, becomes the bare mass again. Yes, so not very roughly speaking, the energy scale has to be below 
the, the Raman coupling strength here to here in order to be in a sort of a low energy effective description uh, of this. In the paper, I think I, let me see if I put a citation to it in, I did. So in this nature physics paper, we really thought, of, this is the uh, artificial electric field result. We actually thought a lot about this low energy effective description and sort of said this, this has conceptual, although not mathematical relations to the emergence of low energy field theories out of some high energy, you know, a real description of the universe. Now, the actual particulars have nothing to do with it, but the idea that there's a low energy sector where you have these gauge fields. And if you go to high energy, really high energy, you're not even gonna notice these avoided crossings. You're just gonna see three parabolas. So this is absolutely low energy physics. Yeah, and, and so I guess this is the reason in your vortex nucleation plot, why there's an, a dependence on omega. Uh, yeah. And then I guess as omega becomes small, it becomes sort of the textbook result you'd predict for magnetic field. Uh, other way around, it's mega, omega becomes big. Omega becomes big, sorry. You want energy small uh, scale small compared to omega. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, effect, the mass would come closer and closer to the true effective mass, the true, true bare mass. In this system, the mass is anisotropic because it's heavier along one direction, the Raman beam direction, and lighter along the other two. So there's... Uh, all of that went into the comp computation. Ah, this this gray line included all the effective mass issues and everything. So it gotcha. was the real. Yeah. Um, and uh, can a spatially dependent mass be interesting? Oh yeah. So, uh, are you guys happy if I if I comment a little bit on experiments we're aiming to do in the near future? I don't mind. <laughs> okay, so I think, so years ago I talked, talked to Mark, Rud Mark Rudner when we were visiting Aspen and uh, he had a really neat idea and I, I, still, I still hold it's really neat. So what he pointed out is that um, if you adopt the language of spin orbit coupling, which is not in this talk, you can ask, let me see if I can have a picture that at least allows me to wave my pointer at something. Where do I have some gaps opening up in the spectrum? Here we go. Um, if you focus at this avoided crossing right there and open it by a little bit, you'll see that you have a very light positive mass on the top and a very a light negative mass on the bottom. So what Mark pointed out to me is that if you have one of the two Raman beams be a speckle beam, you can have this gap opening up randomly throughout the system. And the cool thing, is if the speckle beam actually has an optical field with a negative phase on it, which half of the speckles will have, the sign of the mass reverse, the, the, which one of the spin states has which mass flips. So you have this random mass model. And it turns out that that is a pretty commonly appearing motif in models of disordered systems. So you can make a uh, study localization in that kind of system. So that's not exactly the question you were asking, but I think it's a super cool idea. And that's one we're pondering. Uh, the, another one that we're not just pondering, we're setting up to do is use, returning to this exact scheme. If you, you can also make position um, disordered magnetic fields. So the technical implementation is to notice that, well, yes, here we're using a magnetic field gradient to shift the vector potential, but you can also use the vector component of light shift. So for those of you who that's code word, that's code word for a optical potential that is a rank one tensor that gives a shift proportional to some internal state, which is exactly what the Zeeman shift does, shift one up in energy or they're down by energy. So if you make such a vector light shift beam and shine it in the Z direction coming down on the 2D system and make that a speckle beam, you'll end up with a statistically random magnetic field, which is some other iconic problem in disordered systems. And for the bosonic system, which is living near these minima, that's easier to do than trying to access the random mass near this crossing. So yeah, that is a virtue of this scheme is that it is easy to make inhomogeneous uh, potentials. And as long as you're aiming for an experiment whose lifetime is less than about a second, then this is a, a fantastic mechanism. Cool, thanks. Sorry, this, this uh, mass opening, uh, everything that we talk right now essentially is a bulk of the system, right? It's not edge. It's a, the, 
can you also open up the mass uh, mass gap on the edge of the system with the different signs? Because okay, if so you do I, that, because if you uh, do that, then you can get this higher order topological phases essentially. That's it. so. I'm going to give you a very cautious response to that. Okay. So the first thing is that all these experiments were done in harmonic traps. So step one is you need to put some kind of interface into the system. And actually, I think the easiest interface to put into it is not a hard wall potential, but actually an in-situ interface between two different topological uh, instances of the same system. So flipping inside the system from, if you're doing a churn insulator from turn number of plus one to minus one or, or plus one to zero, but making sure you're well inside the system. Making edges on the outside is, is kind of tricky. So an in, interior, interior interface is probably easier. So then to address the second part of your question, imagine that we have engineered a Z2 topological insider, which we have not. Mm -hmm. Then if you apply an orbital magnetic field of this kind, you're going to be breaking time reversal symmetry, which is going to, in, in the 1D edges of this 2D system, be starting to gap out those uh, edge modes. But I don't think that's what you're wanting to do. No, no I, I want to, you know, I want a two-dimensional system and gap out the, each edge with different sign. Then at the corner, you're gonna get them uh, corner moves. That's 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 a that's a one way to get the higher order moves. Okay, so I, I might speculate that that could work if you made a Z2 topological insulator, and then in addition, Raman coupled the edge modes together in such a way as to open a gap, uh -huh. and only the edges, which could be tricky, because if you if you if you do a bulk Raman coupling in addition to your Z2 insulator, you're probably going to break the Z2 insulator everywhere. I see. Uh -huh. And you'd have to redo this all with fermions, right? Well, yeah. I'm an optimist, right? If we're talking about non-interacting systems. You do what the photonic people do, and you just throw your bosons into some state and see what they do. It's cool. All right, so let's let me see how I'm doing with my time here. I got about half an hour left, so let's see what we can do with synthetic dimensions for half an hour. All right, so this, uh, although I'm going to talk about synthetic dimensions, the underlying scheme for creating these gauge fields. Um, doesn't depend on being synthetic dimension. And I'm gonna actually add a slide here that I had intended to skip uh, to make this a little bit more general for you guys. Okay, so let's get past this fancy artist version of what's going on. So I'd like to turn from making large magnetic fields in a continuum to large magnetic fields in a lattice. And you might want to do this for lots of reasons. Uh, two of those reasons are if you're in a lattice, you can start having better access to strong interactions like I mentioned before. But in addition, if you're in a lattice, you can begin to see quantum fractals like the Hofstadter butterfly, which even without interactions is a, a, a quite a complicated system. And in my intro slide, I had almost chaos written down. It was in reference to that. So at very certain points in the, in the, in the quantum fractal, you will find places that have behavior which is almost chaotic in, sen in the sense that there is a, I can say distribution reminiscent of, of the Wigner-Dyson Wigner -Dy distribution, but it's a different one. So it's not quite, not quite chaotic. It's like threshold, which is quite cool. So these are some reasons you might want to do this. And specifically what we're gonna do in this section of the talk is engineer something that looks like a long strip. It's gonna, I don't know if you had bubble gum rolls when you were a kid, we'd unroll the gum. It's kind of like that. It's gonna be three sites across, and it's gonna be really long, dozens to hundreds of sites in length. And our goal is to into individually control the tunneling along the X direction and the tunneling along the S direction. And S, I think, as you may have gathered already, is gonna mean synthetic direction. And we're gonna do it in such a way that when you hop around a plaquette, one might acquire a phase phi, and we're gonna target about one third per plaquette. Okay. Uh, this is the part where I want to sort of comment that you don't have to have synthetic dimensions to do this. And the underlying ideas, which are going to be in the slide I just unskipped, are equally applicable to lattices, real space lattices in 2D. So versions of this have been beautifully done uh, in Munich and Emanuel Bloch's group and in MIT and Wolfgang Ketterle's group, um, both of which demonstrated the appropriate tunneling phases 
to give effective magnetic fields in the lattice. And the Munich, you know, this is an older Munich experiment. They've measured topological invariance. They've looked at physics of fraction point of, uh, not fraction of quantum Hall physics, but Hofstetter physics has really done quite beautifully. So this, this approach works very nice, it has other lifetime limits that I think this is an appropriate time to mention. Uh, the best description of this is in terms of a Floquet picture, which involves time modulation. And this time modulation to date always involves some degree of heating. So in fact, the lifetimes in these kind of light assisted lattices uh, so far have been less in fact than we were able to realize in the continuum case. So that's sort of a problem that people are working on that is to be solved. And in the bigger picture, uh, this kind of photon assisted tunneling or modulation has created other topological lattices as well, uh, but not necessarily ones that are associated with uniform magnetic fields. So I'm gonna present a picture from Klaus Sengstock's group in Hamburg and Tillman Esselier's group in, in ETH Zurich, where they've created various versions of this, um, but not for the uniform magnetic field case. So for the uniform magnetic field case, if there's one thing you take away from this section, please let it be this slide. Let me explain how this works. So what we're gonna do is start with a 2D lattice here. It's gonna have tunneling J along both directions. It's an innocent lattice. You can make a mod insulator out of. It's inoffensive. It just sits there and atoms tunnel around. The first thing we're gonna do is apply a gradient along the M direction, which is the vertical direction. So I'm gonna, for some reason, I can't remember when I made this slide, it's gonna be two delta per site. Okay. Uh, what this gradient is gonna do is inhibit tunneling along the vertical direction. Atoms can still tunnel along the horizontal direction, but because this state is off resonant with that state or when to call it a Vanier Stark lattice, uh, ladder, um, atoms located here will not tunnel either to the left or to the right. However, they will still be confined in tightly localized Vanier functions. So they're still in a lattice, but they're no longer tunneling. Now, what we're gonna do is come along with a running wave of light along this direction, um, basically a propagating lattice that is exactly resonant. Um, it's photon, the velocity or it's the photon frequency difference between these things is resonant with this difference. So what that's gonna do is reestablish tunneling along this direction because of the time modulation from this propagating or running lattice potential, okay? Great, so now we have turned off tunneling and we've turned it back on. Why did we do this? Well, the reason we did this is that this tunneling matrix element comes with a phase and it's the local optical phase associated with this beam coming in at some angle. So if you look at these uh, lines I've drawn at a diagonal here, those are meant to indicate lines of constant phase. And what that means is an atom tunneling from here to here will pick up a different phase than an atom tunneling from there to there as according to this beam at an angle. And it so conspires that when you go up in this direction across and down, you get a net phase, which is the difference between the wavefront that intersected here and the wavefront that intersected there. But the cute thing, the trick of this is that difference doesn't depend upon what plaquette you're in. So you end up arriving in a situation with a uniform effective magnetic field because of this photon assisted tunneling. Okay, that's how, that's how all of these, that's how these two schemes work. They both have running beams that uh, instantiate tunneling and imprint a phase upon the system that when a gradient type is applied is spatially uniform. That's the general scheme. And what I'd like to do with my little remaining time is show how that can be done in synthetic dimensions in particular. So in the synthetic dimension problem, what we do is begin with a, a Bose condensate. This could be fermions too. Um, we illuminate it with a pair of counterpropagating lasers. And in this experiment, it was a 1064 nanometer laser beam that made a one dimensional optical lattice confiding atoms to Vanier orbitals, one of which I've schematically illustrated there. So if we did nothing else, what we will have done is made a 1D chain that atoms can hop along. That's our real direction. And the states I've grayed out are different internal states. So the idea is to rather than think about internal states as a level ladder like this, to say to yourself, well, really, what is a site? Well, a site is just a place that you label by an integer. 
Well, I label these by integers too. I call that mf equals minus one, zero and plus one. So I would prefer to now arrange them vertically and say this is site plus one, site zero and site minus one. And mathematically it's this integer labeling or discrete labeling probably more particularly that allows us to think about this as a lattice. These are places in a generalized sense where quantum amplitude can reside. Okay, so let's go back to reality now. So what we do is we have our counter propagating beams making the optical lattice I already described. And we come along with one of two alternate uh, or auxiliary fields. One of them is an oscillating magnetic field. This oscillating magnetic field is tuned to the resonance condition between those states that can drive RF transitions. Or we have a pair of counter propagating Raman lasers. In fact, literally the same lasers that I described in the previous part of this talk, which can also drive transitions between these spin states. And in this language, uh, here's how the, the trick of this works. Uh, this is a counter propagating beam here, this along the same direction as this laser. So you can imagine then that the Raman coupling has a spatially dependent phase, uh, which I'm plotting here. I have a Raman coupling. Uh, what is this phase? Well, when I go from the right going to the left going blue beam, I acquire two photon recoils of momentum. How do you describe momentum changes in quantum mechanics? By e to the i k recoil x. That is the operator that it prints two photon recoils of momentum change to a quantum state. And that therefore is my synthetic tunneling matrix element. It's a position dependent phase. Now, uh, the L direction is a position along which that varies. So X here is a continuous variable. L is a discrete variable spaced by the lattice spacing here, which is lambda L divided by two. So lambda by two lattice. So that is the uh, X spacing. KR, well, what's KR? KR is two pi upon lambda Raman. There's the two pi. And there's a variable I'm now uh, calling phi is simply the ratio of lambda lattice in the numerator to lambda Raman in the denominator here, giving a number of 1.32, really close to 1.33. That in fact is exactly the phase we're looking for to create a magnetic field. Here's how it works, just like the previous example. Imagine you start at that site. If you move to that site, you acquire no phase. Now that has, let's start here. here. When you go to site L, you acquire a phase, which if you look over to the graph here, is L plus one, because I moved over one. I move that direction. Now I go to here, no phase, and I move down here. I tunnel the opposite direction. I get a phase of minus L. When I sum it up, I had an L plus one here, minus L, giving me an overall phase uh, number here of one and a net flux uh, integrated phase of 1.32 times the flux quantum. So this explicitly is the mechanism by which this tool creates large fluxes in this plaquette. And to be honest with you, it's an accident that for us it's really close to 1.33 in this experiment. Um, this laser is at 790 nanometers for atomic physics reasons. This one's at 1064 because it's cheap to get optical power at 1064. In a follow-up experiment I won't describe, we started tuning with this and played around with that ratio. There we go. Okay, so we're back to this. Um, I don't think we need to do the Hamiltonian for it today, so I will just omit that. And instead, I want to show you what data looks like. Um, so I had a question about the <clears throat> synthetic dimension part. Yeah. Um, so here, I guess uh, you're limited to having uh, one third of the sites occupied, and then in addition, on every like uh, on every column, there is a conserved quantity where like. Uh, the number of particles there is always one. Uh, no. So to start with, we're working with bosons. So in, in, in fact, there's probably a hundred or so particles on each of these sites when we start. So they're strongly occupied. Uh, secondly, there is, is tunneling along this longitudinal direction. So uh, there is not a particle number conservation in each of these uh, triplets. And then Thirdly, these are, they, they don't tunnel one at a time anyway. So actually I'll, I have a slide for that one. Uh, it, it wasn't meant to answer your question, but it will. So I'll use it to do that. So yeah, so, so and then hopefully in this slide or the next slide, I'll, I can address that question. So here's what data looks like for this experiment. It's really the same measurement paradigm as before. There's a gradient vertically. It will separate this now, instead of calling them spins, we'll call them sites. We'll measure where the atoms were vertically. 
And along the horizontal axis, you still measure the momentum. And uh, the histogram on the right is simply the integral of this quantity along the uh, X direction to plot the probability in the three different sites. So this is classic atom diffraction, like just what you see with any kind of optical lattice and all the atoms are in a chronic or delta and M equals zero. You now turn on tunneling using the RF coupling. And I mentioned this earlier, but now I'll hammer it home. The RF coupling is spatially homogeneous. So its phase does not depend upon position. Thereby you've created a synthetic dimension lattice with a uniform magnet, uh, sorry, no, no magnetic field present at all. Real value tunneling everywhere. And here what we see is that the, there are three replicas of the original momentum distribution just shifted upwards. And if I plot the histogram, what you see is you're tracing out a discretized version of the ground set harmonic oscillator in a box potential. So really what's happening is that every atom is in a coherent superposition living with inside this box potential wave function. Uh, this problem is a fully separable problem. So we're indeed what we're seeing is the dynamics or statics, I guess, along the horizontal direction are independent of what's along the vertical direction. Okay, so this is no magnetic field. Um, I'll show you what happens. So now I want to turn to what I think will be the last thing I do today, which is let's see what happens when we put on a magnetic field. And I want to use a classical picture to motivate what's going on. So if we have a classical strip with a magnetic field applied, there are two kinds of solutions to this one. One are internal cyclotron orbits where this, the edge is not intersective. And the size of these orbits is given by the cyclotron length and the minimum cyclotron length in a quantum system is the magnetic length LB over here. Uh, in addition, you have skipping orbits on the periphery of the system where the motion of a cyclotron orbit is interrupted by the hard wall off of which the electron or atom then reflects, giving rise to net edge currents of, of some kind. So let's see how this intuition then applies to what we do in our quantum system. So in a generic continuum quantum system, um, this is a calculation for quantum Hall kind of cases, there are edge states localized on the edge where the Fermi energy might, of a fermionic system might hit the edge. And I didn't plot one, I should have. There is a Gaussian wave packet all over the center corresponding to these bulk states. And the extent of these are all nominally given by the magnetic length. So here we go. Here's the case with no magnetic field present that I showed you before. Here is an eigenstate of the system for which the average occupation is located in the center of the system. What you notice is now the momentum is shifted as you move in the upwards direction. Um, you can think about this formally as this is no longer being a separable problem. So the motion along the X direction is now dependent upon the dynamic or the motion along the Y direction. Classically, you can also think about this very simply that as an atom tunneled upwards from this site to that uh, layer, it will experience a Lorentz force, which will change the momentum. And it so happens that numerically, it changes it by exactly the right amount to displace over there. But I wanna emphasize that this is an eigenstate. Um, the second thing I'd like you to notice is that the histogram has gotten a whole lot narrower. That is because the classical cyclotron orbit is now small compared to that original wave packet here. So we're orbiting over a tiny area in this eigenstate of the system. So we've seen that effect. Next, I plot two more eigenstates of the system. This is an eigenstate of the system corresponding to the negative edge, and this is an eigenstate corresponding to the positive edge. Each of these are also significantly narrow. And I'd like to point out their similarity to these slightly skewed edge states that would be present in a more extended system. Okay, so those are three more eigenstates we can engineer. Um, we can flip the sign of the magnetic field. Uh, that's a slide I skipped. I think it's kind of cool. So I will show that. So if, we, if you flip the sign of the magnetic field based on what, what, do I, what I told you, what do you guys think is gonna happen? The orbits reverse. Yeah, right. So using the classical intuition, the direction of the cyclotron or the Lorentz force will flip. And that's what happens. 
So this blob, oops, goes to the opposite side. The histograms basically don't change at all. The eigenstates look the same in terms of their density, but exactly where these orders land change. So I think the last thing I'll show you is a bit of dynamics. So can I ask you a question here? Um, yeah, totally. In your lattice, you really have a, you really have a just three layers, uh, minus one, zero, and plus one. And talking about the edge, essentially, uh, I mean, bulk, separation of the edge and bulk here is a little bit solid, right? Because uh, m equal to zero only it's bulk and plus one and minus one are essentially edge. It's just everything is edge in the system except m equal to zero. Uh, so the, how, how, how do you, I mean, can, can you also increase in the vertical direction, the number of the sites, then, then we can talk about the edge a little bit more. Uh, yeah, so there's two answers to that. First, there is the uh, self-centered answer. So we did a follow-up experiment to this using the F equals two manifold of rubidium where we have five sites, which gives a lot more edge. And then I don't know who the senior author is on it, but so I may be wrongly attributing senior authorship. If so, shame on me. But at, at, the, uh, at least at the group that Jean Dalibard is part of at Collège de France, they've been doing this with dysprosium, which has a plethora of internal states. So they have both continuum results and I think Mason lattice results out as, as well now, where that I, system- I think it was Silver, yes, and Ben is the senior author. Okay. So, so look that one up if you want to be convinced of bulk versus edge. Yes, um, it's interesting. There's a you, you can also ask the question of what happens if you go to two levels. Uh -huh. What is it then? And it turns out it's all edge. There's a so the it, it looks like the edge dynamics wins. And and what what is the number of the sites there? Two two sites. Oh, two, oh, if you go two to sites. two. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean yes, yeah. Of course, everything is edge then. Yeah, there's not. But it, it, it ends up looking like edge as opposed to some hybridized mess. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting that it still is localized, really. I mean, yeah. typically bulk uh, would obscure the effect of edge, but it's really interesting. Yeah. This so the, the saving grace in the system is that the field is large, so the cyclotron front orbit size is small, so that the spatial extent of this wave packet is narrow enough that it really lives on zero. If you go to small fields where the magnetic length increases, then these are just hybridized. You don't see any of that. All right, so the very last thing I wanna show is a dynamics experiment. Uh, in this experiment, we made analogy to edge magnetoplasmons and condensed matter physics. So this is some data I've loved for many years. It's from Ray Ashuri when he was, a, he's a professor at MIT now when he was a postdoc at Bell Labs. So what they did is they made a legitimate chunk of quantum hall and evaporated little electrodes over it and applied a voltage pulse to that. And what that did is launch an excitation that ran around the periphery of this quantum Hall system, which is then capacitively picked up on a second tab. And here is a signal that they observed. Okay, so that you can see this pulse running around the system, which is really cool. So this is not an edge state in the usual sense. This is a coherent superposition of electrons between different Landau levels here and here. Okay. So this is the thing, this is a legitimate large scale quantum dynamics whose time scale is the cyclotron frequency. That's what the splitting is coming from here. And this, in fact, is the quantity that's associated with the skipping orbits that I plotted before. Those go at the cyclotron frequency and dance around the edge. So we create, and we're gonna to try to create an edge magnetoplasmon. So I wanted to draw the contrast. This is not thinking about the edge states that are relevant for top currents and topological systems. That's a different question. And anyway, we did the experiment. We prepared all the atoms on one edge. We allowed them to tunnel. And you could see them bouncing down the edge, going one way, or the other way. And, and that, that's where I think I'm gonna to end today. This work, uh, our work was published back to back with the work from the group of Leonardo Fulani who did the very similar experiments in fermionic ytterbium. And obviously it had a different take on it, but at the end of the day, we saw very similar stuff. So yeah, I'll end with that. And it's hard to, as an experimentalist, not advertise what you're doing now. So, I'm not gonna talk about any of this. That's what, since this is going up on YouTube, you guys, if you're curious about what this work is, you can check out these other recent publications. Um, 
but I wanted to flash that for work in progress as well as stuff that's currently in preparation. And with that, I'm going to just go back to the, come on, the previous slide and take any remaining questions you have. Great. So thanks for the great talk, Ian. Um, yeah, questions. I had a couple. Um, oh. One was, uh, are you in the like the lowest Landau level, or how do I see that? Which Landau level do you occupy, or where are those? Okay, so that is a great question, and I need to locate my slide that can address that question. I bet it's one of these. Okay, I'm going to go. Can you guys see this screen? We see the one that says prelude to the next section. Sweet, yeah, good. So I'm gonna not go to slideshow mode because I might have to do more. Let's see what figures I have here. So the concept of Lando level was a little bit fuzzy when you go into a lattice. So here is some calculation of the actual eigenstates of the system computed in a lattice and the sort of thing you can put around quotes is that you can have a group of states that are kind of like Lando levels. And then because it's a, a proper topological system in a lattice, there's going to be edge states as well. And do I have a Hofstede or butterfly picture? No. Yeah, so, so I did some modeling for this to put in a supplementary material. And the take home message is this, that, oops, ah. Sorry, my arrow keys don't do anything like what I think they're going to do right now. Here we go. So there is a concept in uh, the Hofstetter problem, uh, lattices plus magnetic fields of a magnetic unit cell. And what the magnetic unit cell is describing is the actual elementary cell over which the Hamiltonian is translationally invariant. So once you've selected a gauge, um, then you're going to have to identify the magnetic unit cell. So for example, in the Landau gauge, you end up with these columnar magnetic unit cells whose extent is given by the ratio, the flux expressed as a rational number P over Q. And you take Q, which is gonna be then the extent of this column. Okay. So that's our magnetic unit cell. And the infinite system, you, it, this really is just in the lattice problem, you then diagonalize it. So to address the question of Landau levels, you need to think a little bit more. And it turns out that the, resp the correct response is this. If your system size along the, is smaller than the magnetic unit cell, then for all intents and purposes, you get smooth Lando levels. If the system size is appreciably larger than one unit cell, you get lattice physics instead. And I, I, I uh, this, I'm like 95% sure I put this in the self-promotion material of Ben and Stuhl and Shani Lu's uh, science paper. So if you'd like to see a more cognizant description of it, I would go there. I guess my second question was, when you were showing those edge states, um, there was the upper edge, down edge, how, how did you isolate them um, oh, experimentally? Great. Oh, that, yeah. So. That's both subtle and interesting. Let's see, do I have eigenstates of the actual problem in this talk? Let's see what Hamiltonians I solved here. So it looks like I don't have eigenstates plotted or the true band structure. So give me just a minute and I will contaminate my talk with another picture. So here we go, let me get this one. Okay, so I'm looking for stool and blue. Here we go. There it is, okay, got it. I'm copying a figure out of a paper and pasting it in a talk. Oh, so if we're lucky, 
you will now see a new figure appearing. Great. All right, so I'm going to just hide the center one here and make this nice and big. Okay, great. Can you all see that? I'm going to assume that that's yes. So here's the actual band structure, the lowest three bands of the system that we did these experiments in. Um, the way to compute this is actually exactly the same as the parabolas I talked about at the first half, except now the curves are sinusoids having to do with the dispersion relation and the lattice. Um, this is actually an exact, exact solution anyways. So to address your question, first, as a function of crystal momentum Qx, the state moves horizontally. So this is this a Landau gauge feature I didn't mention, that the guiding center of the wave packet along y is a, a linear function of the momentum along x. Okay, so these, these variable, there's only one variable left actually, it's, 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 they're the same variable. So what that means is that the position of the cloud, which is given by the, the tone here, continuously changes as you change the momentum. Okay, so that, that's a factoid. So then what we did in this experiment is that we prepared the atoms in one of the three initial states and adiabatically turned on the couplet, turned on the, the Raman lasers to map that state where my cursor is down there, to the mostly pinkish state that's down there. And by doing that, we could load this state. But what I want to emphasize is it's an eigenstate of the system. So it just, I mean, it, you can experience forces from the harmonic trap, but it's not. It doesn't evolve, I guess. It doesn't otherwise evolve in an interesting way. And that's the sort of mixing of position and momentum is kind of subtle in that way. So I have time for one more question because I need to now pick up children. Oh, I see. Uh, so I guess Saeed, uh, you're next up and Anant, you can maybe ask, we're gonna have a wrap up discussion tomorrow uh, uh, that hopefully Ian can join and we can bring it up there or we can try to field Ian's questions for him. Yes, um, and my question is very really quick. Why you guys don't cut the lattice in the horizontal direction instead of vertical? Could you? Say that question. What what, the, what slide the, can I go to? So right now, right now you're looking at the edges at the vertical direction, right? Uh, but we can also look at the edges ah. at the horizontal direction. Then you have more number of sites in the horizontal, at least. Okay, that's a wonderful question, and the answer has two parts, both of which are entirely technical. Oh, okay. So the first part is that this apparatus doesn't have spectacularly good imaging resolution. It has, as it is right now, it has about a two micron resolution and the lattice spacing is about uh, 500 nanometers. So we can't see the single site resolution with this, this apparatus as it is right now. Secondly, we don't have hard enough walls in the apparatus to have good edge, state, uh, edge reconstruction going on. Right, edge formation, I guess it's not reconstruction, that's fraction quantum hall physics. So the fact that we have such glorious edges in the synthetic dimensions results from the fact that we have a perfectly infinitely hard wall that really doesn't can't be constructed other than using tricks of this type. I see, I see, okay. So this sort of comes back to my earlier question, uh, comment that if we wanted to see internal edges like longitudinal edges, what I would be doing here is using uh, a digital mirror device to imprint Raman coupling that has opposite momentum or zero momentum exchange in one half of the system and not the other so that I'm guaranteed an interface between two topologically distinct zones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So uh, Ian, I guess uh, you can uh, go do your family duties and we will see you tomorrow. Anant, uh, others, please bring your questions tomorrow and uh, continue this great discussion. So thanks for the fantastic talk, Ian, and I'll see